The bright April sun illuminates an impressive looking gentleman in a pressed uniform astride a magnificent gray stallion on a dusty road. He guides the horse up to the broad stairs of a beautiful two-story brick house on the edge of town. A disheveled individual greets the mounted man and invites him into the house. Two hours later, the crisply uniformed gentleman trudges down the stairs, mounts his horse, and slowly rides off toward the south. With this, one of the most destructive conflicts in human history, the American Civil War, has come to an end. But what road led the USA to this pivotal moment at Appomattox, Virginia? And where would the road lead after? To follow the road to Appomattox and beyond, we'll answer these guiding questions today. What were the political and economic differences between northern and southern states before the Civil War? What events directly led to the outbreak of the Civil War? What was the impact of the Civil War on the United States? And what changes occurred in the United States after the Civil War? And a larger perspective to ponder, was anything actually accomplished by fighting the Civil War? As you learned in a previous lesson, the United States was aggressively expanding across the great western frontier. This expansion led to many challenges, but none more impactful to the growth of the U.S. than the question of slavery. The 22 more heavily mechanized and industrialized northern states generally did not want slavery expanded for two reasons. Number one, the abolition movements attempting to outlaw slavery altogether were almost exclusively found in the North. They saw slavery as an immoral and dehumanizing practice. Number two, unskilled laborers saw the use of enslaved people as unfair free labor that would threaten their jobs. This view was held by many workers in the growing West as well. The 11 southern states were heavily agrarian, producing cash crops such as tobacco and cotton. Much of this cotton was tended by almost 4 million enslaved people, or approximately half of the southern state's population. Most of this cotton would be bound for northern textile mills, driving the further industrialization of the north. As you may have guessed, southern states generally believed that slavery as an institution should be preserved. This back and forth had played out since the founding of the nation, but what about the expansion of slavery to the Western territories? Let's revisit our first guiding question. What were the political and economic differences between Northern and Southern states before the Civil War? Several attempts were made to create a rule regarding slavery in order to stave off a potential conflict. From a previous lesson, you'll remember the Missouri Compromise attempted to limit slavery's expansion, but was hotly contested. The Compromise of 1850 was a collection of five bills that completely changed this earlier compromise. It allowed California to enter as free and gave other territories a choice in the matter going forward. So, that doesn't sound horrible, right? Hang on, there's one more thing. The Fugitive Slave Act included in this compromise required any fugitive enslaved people to be returned to their owners without delay. This move for the first time federalized the institution of slavery and made it a responsibility of all the states to enforce it. Then came the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Passed in 1854, it repealed the Missouri Compromise and created two new territories, both of which could now vote to become slave or free. And then came the 1857 Dred Scott v. Sanford decision. Dred Scott, an enslaved person who had been taken into a free territory by his owner, argued that living in a free territory released him from slavery. The Supreme Court disagreed. In fact, Chief Justice Roger Taney wrote in the opinion that black people are not included and were not intended to be included under the word citizens in the Constitution, and can therefore claim none of the rights and privileges which that instrument provides for and secures to citizens of the United States. Basically, black people would never be citizens and did not have any rights under the law. 
All these factors contributed to the lines between Southern Democrats and the new Northern Republican Party being firmly drawn along the issue of slavery. The election of 1860 was a fraught affair with four presidential candidates. An Illinois legislator named Abraham Lincoln won and became the 16th president of the United States. As Lincoln ran on a platform of curtailing new slave states, the South feared that this would be the end of the institution once and for all. On December 20th of 1860, just a month after the election, South Carolina seceded from the United States. Before we move on, let's revisit our second guiding question. What events directly led to the outbreak of the Civil War? In the previous four years before General Robert E. Lee and General Ulysses Grant met at Appomattox, the American Civil War cost the nation dearly. By the end, over 1.5 million men had served in the Union Army, with a close 800,000 for the Confederacy, with an estimated 851,000 deaths in total. In addition to the cost in manpower, monetary costs were estimated at $5.2 billion for the Union, which is roughly $93 billion today. The staggering cost of keeping large armies in the field caused huge inflation throughout both sides. For example, a loaf of bread in the U.S. in 1860 would run about 10 cents. By 1865, inflation in the North had driven the price to 18 cents. By that same year in the South, a loaf of bread would run an astronomical $9.10. In his second inaugural address, President Lincoln wanted the country to move forward, to bind up the nation's wounds, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. His assassination 41 days after this speech would have calamitous impacts across the freshly rejoined Union. Let's revisit our third guiding question. What was the impact of the Civil War on the United States? So, what changes were spurred by the Civil War? First and foremost, the abolition of slavery. In 1863, in the midst of the war, President Lincoln drafted the Emancipation Proclamation. This executive order freed any slaves in Union-occupied territory, at the time about 3.5 million. The proclamation did not affect any slaves still in Confederate territory, and it also did not cover states with slaves not in rebellion, such as Maryland. Fearing this executive order would be dismissed after the war, Lincoln and the Republicans pushed the 13th Amendment through. It was passed in 1864, forever banning the practice of slavery in the U.S. Second, Reconstruction. The incredible damage done in the war, particularly to the Confederate States, had to be rebuilt in order to help with the binding up the wounds. But, as with almost everything concerning the war itself, there were competing ideas on how to go about it. While some believed that the South should be ushered back in with full status and rights, many felt that those who tried to split the nation apart couldn't be trusted. From 1865 to 1877, thousands of federal troops were stationed in the South to ensure the rights of all were protected. Upon the troops' removal, a large portion of the South promptly limited the rights of black people and put in place a system of laws that created a virtual slave society once again called Jim Crow in reference to a derogatory stage show concerning black people, this system of laws would codify segregation between the races and systematically deny people of color equal opportunity for generations. Thus, much of Southern Reconstruction was accomplished on the backs of incarcerated black people. And third, rapid industrial growth. The Civil War created the need for massive industrial output. The systems that were built to sustain the war effort were then put towards incredible peacetime production, rapidly expanding the industrial might of the United States. This expansion of output also required a massive influx of labor. From the 1870s through the beginning of the 20th century, millions of immigrants poured into the U.S. This influx, as many as 2,000 people per day in the 1870s, totaled almost 20 million by 1917. 
The movement wasn't only from the outside. Scores of black people fled the segregated South looking for opportunities in northern cities. This great migration would see almost 6 million black people migrate north by 1970. Let's answer our final guiding question. What changes occurred in the United States after the Civil War? The massive devastation of the war between brothers brought about an uncertain peace. Slavery was over, but oppression continued. The United States would grow to be the largest industrial power in the world, built on the backs of millions of low-wage workers. As we go forward, we'll look into some of the technological innovations that would create fantastic modern conveniences and bring their own terrifying challenges, because history is everywhere. Hey, hey.